Thanks, Kirk. Thanks. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. It's great to be here at Directions again. It's nice to see a lot of familiar faces. When I was thinking about the material that I was going to use this morning for Directions, it didn't take me long to think about what it should be. For the past several years, since the Great Recession has been winding down slowly, um, clients, a lot of them, and many of you here in the room have been asking me to produce, you know, the very same thing. Many of you, the same thing. Frank, can you show us IDC's big picture view of what the future of the IT and communications industry is going to be? Not for next year or the year after, but really for the next 20 or 25 years. And with good reason, because I think all of us understand that the industry is at this time of great change and transformation. I think we all know that the next 25 years are going to be a lot different than the last 25 years. So we're all looking for what is that brand new frame of reference about the industry that will help us understand, you know, what is the industry going to look like? What are the new opportunities? So we can then make the moves that we need to make to set ourselves up for success for the next decade or two of growth and transformation. So that's my goal uh, this morning, is to really share with you first this new frame of reference. We'll build it together. IDC's view of what the next growth framework is going to look like, the next platform for growth of our industry. You know, this is a once every 25 years transition. And so seeing the new platform, understanding it, understanding the elements, and making the right decisions when we climb onto that new platform are essential. And so what are the right decisions as we climb onto that third platform? We're, we're going to then go and take a look at uh, into the platform and look at four key elements, key ingredients of that platform that are each driving disruptions within the marketplace and are really challenging us and you might say requiring us to follow new paths in these parts of the industry around mobile devices, around the core and cloud, around data and analytics and around the way we think about and put together solutions. So we'll explore that and we'll particularly think about what are the right paths and what are the wrong paths. And then I'll wind up with some advice for some strategic action for the year ahead. So let's jump ahead and take a look at the platform. Now, one thing you'll notice when we start looking at these platforms, people often focus on the technologies. Uh, but what you'll see is that they're really defined less by the technologies and more by the fact that they each have their own scale and scope of users and uses. That's the pattern you'll see. If you look at the first platform, this tiny, tiny cone at the bottom of the slide, it's very hard to read. This was the first platform of growth for the industry. It was around mainframes and terminals. And at that time, only about, let's say, uh, millions, millions of people out of billions of people on the planet touched the technology. You know, they were the white lab coat crowd. Right? You had to go behind the glass walls and the on the raised floors. And they were actually thinking about the uses. There were only about low thousands of packaged applications. So pretty small software industry, packaged software industry. And, and the total opportunity for the industry in this platform that came off of this platform, I, I tend to think of the opportunity, the spending as the product of the users. How many users are out there? And then how many uses do they put this stuff to? It was measured in tens of billions of dollars. Pretty small. Now, when the PC came in the 80s and launched the second platform, we weren't talking about millions of users. We were talking about technologies that reached hundreds of millions of users. And we were talking not about low thousands of packaged applications. The uses this stuff could be put to, to by all these users, we were talking about tens of thousands of packaged applications, and the industry grew as a result of that. We were talking about hundreds of billions of dollars of spending and opportunity for us. And of course, in the last few years, it crested above a trillion dollars. So where are we now? I'd say we're in the exact same spot we were in in the early 1980s. We're looking at the emergence of a brand new platform for growth and expansion for our industry for the next 25 years. What are the key ingredients? At the edge, mobile devices. 
At the core, cloud services replacing the client-server model of delivering capability and value to our, our customers. Connecting the two, we're talking about the emergence of mobile broadband, 4G and beyond, to complete that foundation. And on top of that foundation, two very important value-generating overlays. The emergence of big data and the analytics that we can do against that big data. And of course, social technologies as well. And then rounding out the platform and leveraging that platform, we're going to be seeing hundreds of thousands of new solutions that are about intelligent industries. New industry solutions, we're already seeing it. If you take a look at in retail, or in healthcare, or in media and entertainment, players in those industries are already using these third platform technologies to create new solutions and to transform and expand their industries. We can see it happening already. So when you look at this third platform, it's pretty exciting because now what's the scale and scope? We're not talking about uh, hundreds of millions of users, we are talking about billions of users and we're already well on our way. We've got two billion people connected to the internet already. About half of them, by the way, through mobile devices. And really exciting, we're talking as well about trillions of smart things, smart devices that are connecting into this platform. And then around the, the uses, this is mind-boggling. We're not talking about tens of thousands of apps and services. We're talking about millions. Now, some of you may be saying, well, this is crazy. We can't jump to millions of new applications. Hey, guess again. Just by the end of this year, okay, 2011, the number of apps that run on these mobile devices, the, the Apple ones, the uh, Android ones, if you put those together, there'll be over a million apps available for users in that world. Okay, so we're already there. So, you know, if you think about the opportunity we've enjoyed the last 25 years, it was all about how could we exploit and build on that middle part of the platform, and we did a pretty darn good job of doing it. The next 25 years is going to be about how well do we build a whole lot of new value for the marketplace on the top part, on that third platform. So to me, that's our frame of reference. It's simple, but I think it's, it offers a lot of interesting insights into what we have to do to be successful in the next 25 years and where the opportunity is going to be. And so we'll talk through the rest of our talk about that, about what we need to do as well as what we can build and where the opportunities will be. You know, before we leave this chart, I just want to point one other thing. Those of you who have excellent eyesight may have noticed that, you know, I showed 1986 as kind of a key point in the emergence of this second platform. And the histori historians among you may be thinking, well, gee, Frank, 1986, the PC was introduced in 1981. Why, why didn't you put 1981 there? And the reason is that 1986 was a very important, kind of a fork in the road moment for the industry. For those of you who are there, you'll remember, the first five years of the PC, I mean, it's amazing to think back, the industry was arguing and debating, you know, were these new technologies, uh, were they powerful enough? You know, were they manageable enough? Were they secure enough? You know, were these, were these technologies enterprise worthy? And what happened in 1986 is a lot of folks in the industry stopped debating and started realizing, hey, this is the foundation for our new wave of growth. And a lot of them decided to radically restructure themselves and their offerings and their business models around that second platform, and they jumped on it, and they built a business off it. And you know what? Others, others didn't do it, or didn't do it very well. Now, I'd just like to take a moment to say, uh, I'd like to say my father told me about what was really happening back in 1986, but I have to admit, actually, I was there. I was there, and I was actually working at IDC. This, I was speaking at IDC Directions in Australia in 1986, believe it or not, in this picture. And so I had a front row seat to what was going on. And so this is what I saw. Sort of taking the, the wrong path were companies like Cullinet, 
right? We remember Cullinet. This is, the, this is the neighborhood of Cullinet. And Cullinet, you may remember, they were a giant of the first platform. They were one of the first big package software vendors. They were tremendous, had a lot of smart people. John Cullinane, very intelligent guy. Um, but they made a lot of mistakes around going from the first platform to the second platform. The one I love is, you know, they realized, okay, finally, PCs, we better create some software for that. So they created a product called Golden Gate. And this was supposed to compete with Lotus 1, 2, 3. And they only, but the problem is they made one major error. They decided to not use PC retail distribution channels for this PC software product. Believe it or not, if you were a customer and you wanted to buy PC software from Cullinet, you had to call up a Cullinet direct sales rep you know, to order a six or seven hundred dollar PC package. I mean, the idea, of course, was at the time, account control. Remember, that was a big term, account control. But it played out as, as insanity. I mean, it was a disaster. Okay, Digital, another company that was phenomenally successful, and I think in hindsight we can look and realize, hey, they largely missed that second platform jump. They got pieces of it, but overall, you know, missed the big jump. And, you know, why do I bring them up? Well, what's scary about the digital experience for us today is that even though in hindsight we can, you know, we all sit here wisely in 2011 and say, well, those dummies, it was obvious. Shouldn't they have been jumping right on that second platform? That's a no-brainer. Well, as I said, digital, another smart company, they, they missed it. But they weren't the only dummies. In 1986 and 87, investors on Wall Street were rewarding digital with its record high stock price. So they had missed the growth turn, but the market didn't even recognize that that had happened. So, you know, be careful, you know, as we judge today, who's jumping onto the third platform? Well, don't look at the stock price necessarily. That may or may not give you the right signal. And then Wang, you know, Wang was a powerhouse in its own right. And uh, they made big error mainly around being slow and jumping to the PC. Eventually they did jump on the PC, but they thought, well, gee, we're late. We've got to use the latest chip from Intel. Guess what? That chip was incompatible with a lot of the existing first-generation PC apps. You know, they were thinking first-generation, hey, hot technology, let's go. But they missed this, the importance of the application ecosystem that was a core of the second platform. So I, I just have to stop here and give you a little side story because about a month ago, I was sharing this history uh, with a group. Actually, we were doing directions in Copenhagen, and one of the folks in the audience came up to me afterwards. He was, he was a 38-year-old mobile software company executive. And he said, Frank, thanks, thanks for the historical perspective, uh, which made me feel really old, by the way. Um, but he said, you know, uh, Wang, I, I never heard of them before. <laughs> but while you were talking, I looked them up on Wikipedia. You know, they were a pretty big company. <laughs> and I realized, holy smokes. It's bad enough. You know, you miss the jump from one platform to another. It's, it's not, not that you fail. You become wicked trivia. I mean, that, that's a whole new category of failure. So they weren't the only companies, of course, making the wrong turn. And there were companies making the right turn. So going on the right side of the path, you know, there was a company called, uh, that was actually born on the second platform. And some of you may say, hey, that makes it easier. So this time, like the Amazons or Googles, you know, they don't have to get rid of the old baggage. But, you know, they had a different challenge. PCs Limited, which, by the way, in 1988, they changed their name to Dell Computer. Um, they were doing a kind of weird second platform thing. They were selling PCs by telephone. And people were saying, hey, you know, you can't do that. That's impersonal. Pe how can people trust you? They, they don't see you. Who are, you, who are you? And so what did Dell do? Well, they didn't actually go back to the first platform models and say, oh, gee, we got this wrong. Let's go back in time. No, they augmented and improved their second platform model. And they said in 1986, they said, you know what? If you're not sure about us, we'll offer you money back guarantee. And then they also said, by the way, if something goes wrong, we'll do next day on-site service. And you know what? It worked. So it's, I think about some of the technologies today people say aren't ready for the enterprise. The lesson to me is people are going to spend money and do smart things to make them ready for the enterprise. Okay, we're not going back to the past. Now, a couple of other companies that weren't born on the second platform but did pretty well by making smart second platform decisions, EMC, 
around 1986 and 87, they were just about to hire the engineering team that would develop their Symmetrics large-scale disk system. And that was kind of a cool idea because instead of developing, you know, a large disk by creating these big honking disks, which was the original model, they said, hey, let's take all these, you know, low-cost, reliable, modular PC disks and let's design a system that puts a bunch of those together and then we'll put a lot of smarts around it so that it works. And it's actually a, you know, more cost efficient and a better product. And that, that drove 20 years of incredible wealth building for EMC. Again, leveraging, jumping on that second technology. You know, similarly in the software world, um, SAP was just about to start development in the next generation of their ERP at the time. And they decided, hey, let's do it on the second platform. Let's do it as client server. And guess what? That was R3, which generated, again, 20 years of incredible wealth for them in the industry. So some of you may be saying, well, that's great. But, uh, you know, that was, we can see, you know, some companies made the right decision, some made the wrong decision at this, at this fork in the road. That was 25 years ago. You know, what does that have to do with us today? And what I'd argue is that today, in 2011, we're in exactly the same position as they were 25 years ago. They were, uh, you know, we are looking at the emergence of a new platform. Sorry, let me get this squared away. We're looking at the emergence of a new platform. We have spent the last few years arguing about the enterprise worthiness of cloud, of mobile technologies, of social technologies. I mean, we've, we've all been part of those debates, haven't we? Just like those guys back then. But I would argue that in 2011, what's also similar to 1985 is I think this year it's clear to see a lot of the arguing is subsiding. I think a lot of the smart folks are realizing, hey, it's not, these are not just random interesting new technologies. This is the beginning of a new foundation and we've got to start thinking about what to do. So, hey, guess what? It's us now. It's us and it's our fork in the road time. And we're talking about, are we going to be able to make that jump to the third platform? And who's going to make the jump? And who's going to take the path to Wicked Trivia this time? So I want to spend the rest of our time this morning just exploring that, is thinking about what are the decisions that are going to lead us on the right path this time? And what are the ones that are going to take us down the wrong path? And to do that, I'm going to bring back this framework, this frame of reference. And I'm going to look at four of the ingredients, the essential ingredients of that platform, because it's at that level that the decisions are going to be made. As I mentioned before, four of these, all of them actually, but four I'll focus on, they are bringing disruptive new uh, factors, if you will, forces into the marketplace. So I'm going to talk about what those are. And then those are driving and forcing us to make some, take some very interesting new paths in order to jump successfully onto the third platform. So let's start out by looking at the edge, mobile devices. So let me share with you a couple of kind of startling new realities that are, you know, forming around these new type of mobile devices. Now, the first reality is if you look at the number of non-PC, app-capable mobile devices. So we're talking about smartphones and we're talking about media tablets as two major categories. If you just look at those two categories alone, guess how many of those will be shipped over the next year? About 400 million of them. Now, just to put that in perspective, you know, why is that interesting if you're coming from the second platform? That's about the same number of PCs that'll ship in this coming year. So you can see, you know, these new species of devices and PCs are going to cross over. And guess what? They're never going to ever meet again. The mobile devices are growing so quickly. And I think the obvious point is that in terms of devices, the mobile devices, these new species, they aren't just going to be important edge devices, endpoints on this new platform. They're going to become the predominant endpoint, the predominant on-ramp to this new platform, these new solutions we build on the platform. And on the software side, this is amazing to me. I mean, it blows my mind 
In the last 18 or 24 months, what's happened with apps for mobile devices? By the end of this year, uh, there will be 1.3 million apps, I mentioned that before, for uh, iOS, for uh, Apple, as well as for Android smartphones. I mean, that is amazing. How many PC apps do you think there are? If you think of all the apps that were written to run on, on say, Windows PCs, about 50 to 75,000. 50 to 75,000, 1.3 million. Okay, some of those 1.3 million are things like Angry Birds. All right, I'll give you that. <laughs> okay, but let's say it's hundreds of thousands that will be enterprise capable. I mean, that's a startling disparity. You know, so why is that important? So if you think of, and, and remember only one thing I say today, remember this, the most dependable rule, if you want to understand what's happening in the IT market, is that the market always follows the solutions. Okay, if you know where the solutions are going, which platforms, which environments, if you know where the developers are going, you know where the money's going. And so this is what's happening in the end device applications market. These mobile devices are sucking the oxygen out of the traditional PC developer and application world. Okay, so what are, the, what are the paths that these realities tell us? If you are in this world of, of devices, and particularly the PC world, well, it's obvious. I mean, if you don't know this by now, you're in trouble. You need to expand your portfolio of devices to include all of these new species of mobile devices. But I'd go beyond that, and I'd say we need to prioritize and reprioritize our portfolio, because if you think that these new devices, you know, they're not going to be additions, they're going to become more important than PCs for your success in the marketplace. So you better treat it appropriately, you better invest in them appropriately, and your survival depends on your ability to do that. On the application side, one obvious point is you have to adopt and excel at the cloud-based application distribution model that's come with these mobile devices, you know, that we saw in the iTunes store, we've seen in the, in the Android marketplace. Um, you know, this, this is a developer's dream. This is one of the reasons the apps have grown so quickly in these worlds. You know, think about an app developer in this world. You know, the, the old world was, if I have an application, how do I get my app to market? You know, I have to, you know, get it somehow out through the incredibly complex and expensive traditional retail channel. And then, how do I support it? I don't even know where it is. And how do I c convince customers to upgrade it? You know, now take out, whether it's your Android or your iPhone or your Blackberry or your Mo uh, Windows Mobile or your WebOS. Okay, did I get all the, all the platforms? Okay, good. No one's going to yell at me. But you just pull it out. Okay? Now, uh, right there, over the wire, you have access to all the applications you could possibly want. You know, all the support that to, to update this, all of us, you, you know, you can, it's right there. I can push a button. I can push the screen. And it's uh, daily, I can do it, weekly. If I'm ADD, I can do it every five minutes. You know, I can keep updating my apps. So if you're a developer, once you get on one of these app marketplaces, you know, I've solved my distribution problem. I've solved my support problem. I've solved my upgrade problem. You know, so, so... You know, what this means, obviously, is I think in the, it, this is not just about mobile device software. It's about all software. And if you're in the PC world, it means that if you're in the PC software world, you have to adopt this model. So I think what's, you know, Apple's already drawn the picture for us. They've already announced the Mac app marketplace, App Store. And so none of us will be surprised in the slightest when, when uh, Microsoft announces a Windows app store and follows the same model. What may surprise you, and we'll talk about it in just a minute, is that this model is also going to move up into the big scale enterprise apps market as well. So there are a lot of you know, new realities, a lot of forks in the road, a lot of new paths we have to follow to get on this third platform if, you, if you're entering through this part of the market. Now I'm happy to say Bob O'Donnell in a few minutes will be peeling back the onion to talk a little bit more about even more of the things we need to do. Let's jump next from the edge to the core. Now we're talking about cloud here. And cloud is really transforming the core. Of, of our delivery capability in the market. And so I'm thinking about folks who particularly are in the enterprise apps business or provide infrastructure for the enterprise apps business. We're gonna talk about some realities that are important for you and some paths you're gonna have to take. Um, I want, you know, uh, Michelle Bailey is gonna talk later this morning as well about cloud. And she'll be, you know, diving in and going through a lot of our detailed view of what's gonna happen in cloud. So I wanna just focus on a couple of things, a couple of dimensions of the cloud's impact. 
One is really to pick up on this application concept. That law I said, which is the market always follows the solutions. You know, in, the, in this enterprise solution space, I think we need to think about that. You know, where are the solutions going to move in this third platform? And I think we're already seeing the clues. If you think about the benefits of the cloud model for the developer in the mobile apps market I just talked about, it, it applies as well to the enterprise market. You know, that, that, that speed to develop and to distribute a new application, the velocity at which we can introduce new functionality, new capabilities, the ability at relatively low marginal cost to dramatically expand my addressable market, to address my market reach, you know, that really resonates with developers. And so what we're seeing, one incredible reality in the market that we're seeing emerge this year is that the developers of enterprise apps are, are voting with their feet and they're voting for the public cloud as a, as a primary development and deployment platform. We estimate that about 80% of all the new applications, the new applications that come to market, so developers come up with a new idea, they come up with a new enterprise app, are going to be available in cloud model, in SaaS model, if you will. Doesn't mean they aren't also, you know, some of them may hedge their bets and also deliver through traditional channels as well. But really, the trajectory is clear. The mo momentum is clear. You know, the public cloud is certainly the preferred model, you know, for developers who, again, want to get the benefits. And this is going to build over time so that by 2014, it's not just what the developers are doing, it's what the customers are doing. By 2014, we expect about 30% of all customer spending on enterprise apps is going to be through the cloud. Right, so this is a tide that's building. So that's, that is obviously a fundamental shift in the world of enterprise apps and the infrastructure that, su that supports it and really this core of IT delivery. Um, and, you know, people sometimes think about the debate between public cloud and private cloud. You know, private cloud, I don't want to disparage that. That's it's very uh, valid for some customers to want to run these things behind their firewall. But I will say that there's no question, public cloud wins that battle just simply because of this, that that's where most of the solutions are going to be. And that as a developer, you know, if somebody wants to run it behind their firewall in a private cloud, you shrink wrap the public cloud version of your code, and then you can run it on a software or hardware appliance behind the firewall. But you develop first for the private cloud, or rather for the public cloud. So. Um, now, if you are a big fan of public cloud in this debate, don't get too cocky, okay? Because one other reality that we're seeing emerge is that even by the time we get way out to 2020, we still expect that over 80% of Global 2000 companies are going to have a lot of their IT still sitting behind their firewall in traditional systems that have never moved, as well as renovated systems that are private cloud behind a firewall. So they're going to be having what we'd consider hybrid IT environments. So what do these three things mean in terms of the path? If you're in this part of the market, again, if you're in enterprise apps or if you're in the infrastructure that supports them, some very important paths we have to follow. One is if we really believe that all those solutions and more and more of them are going to migrate over time onto a cloud deployment model, we better get very friendly with service providers. We better have excellent relationships with them, and more importantly, we better have excellent offerings that are targeted towards service provider needs. You know, we're estimating that this year, about 12% of all storage and server sales will be to service providers of all kinds, 12%. But that by 2014, that's going to be almost 20%. I mean, that is a pretty rapid trajectory. And so you can see that service providers are becoming a much more strategic channel and customer segment for us as we look at this third platform in this part of the world. Um, if you're an enterprise developer, I kind of made this point already. Um, the old model was I take my old code base, can I somehow host it out on the cloud? The new model is, no, we've got to do exactly what the new guys are doing, which is we have to design first for the public cloud, and then if somebody wants to run it in a private cloud, let's shrink wrap that code base and put it on an appliance. So, to me, this is a very vital transition. We need to get on the new architecture very quickly. And so we expect in 2011 and 2012, many of your favorite enterprise apps vendors are going to do this very thing. They'll announce their next code base of their, you know, applications, and they'll be designed for the cloud. They'll be ready to run on the cloud in a native mode. Um, third point is really around 
platform as a service, and that's really a geeky term, so I apologize for that. But I talked last year, if you'll remember, that really platform as a service, these big public marketplaces of enterprise apps that are developing, you know, Microsoft's Azure, uh, Salesforce.com's Force.com, the Google App Engine, um, Amazon just announced Beanstalk, you know, IBM's going to be doing things here, Oracle, no doubt. The guys who own developers now in a traditional model, they're creating these platforms in the cloud to lure developers onto their clouds. And I said, that's one of the power positions in the market. Now, what's happened since then is I've had a lot of conversations with executives in telcos, in IT companies that don't have developer ecosystems and app middleware like Dell and HP. I've talked to IT services companies like CSC and Accenture, and they say, well, gee, what do we do about platform as a service? I guess we don't really do anything. We just kind of hang out with those guys and do partnerships with them. My point is that uh, I think in this new platform, everyone's going to have to have a platform as a service offering of their own. Now, what I mean by that is you're going to have to be able to let your customers have a view of the solutions that are available to them through the good graces of you and your environment that, and that, uh, that, cr that give them the sense of the value of doing business with you. So this old model of I'm in hardware, I'm in infrastructure, I don't deal with developers, I don't do deal with applications, that's obsolete. That's the Wikipedia path. So the idea that we've been working on is, hey, not everyone's not going to develop their own developer community. That's not a natural act for some of the companies I just talked about. But what you can do is create what we call a meta marketplace, a meta platform, where you're creating almost a virtual view of a variety of these real platform environments. Only you are managing the view to it, and you're doing it because you're doing quality control work. You're doing a curated view of the services available to your customers. You know, we've already got a model of this in the consumer world. You know, Google TV, Roku, you know, these companies don't, they do over-the-top access to media and content on the, on the net, and they don't own or control the content. But what they do is they give the pledge to a customer, we're going to make the connections, the technical connections, and we're going to make sure that we get you to the good stuff. Right? And they compete on that basis. So bottom line is, by the end of this year into next year, you're going to have to decide, hey, I'm either going to jump in with the real platform as a service guys, and that's a big commitment. Not everyone can do that. But minimally, if I don't do that, I have to think about how do I create a meta marketplace for myself. And then last point is, if uh, we're going to have so much hybrid IT, even out in 2020, I can guarantee you one thing. We're going to have zero, zero major players in IT that are pure play public cloud and can't accommodate you know, implementing their capabilities in a private cloud setting. And vice versa. There, there's going to be no such thing as a major IT vendor who's just a private cloud specialist and isn't vigorously competing and winning in public cloud. I think the reason is obvious. Because if you, if you can't do both, you're going to be boxing yourself out of a heck of a lot of growth in the future. So, so I think you know, there's a lot to think about in cloud. As I said, Michelle's going to talk more about that. But you know, these are the fateful decisions we're going to need to make this year, not only recognizing the cloud, but making the right decisions on what to do about it. Now, the third thing I want to look at is big data. You know, we're going to have a lot of sessions and, and a nice panel this afternoon about big data, so I don't want to co-opt them. But I want to give you my view of some key realities that are happening here, and I think some important paths that people who play in this part of the world, the data and information analytics world, need to think about as they jump to the third platform. One is that the crush of data is, is continuing to happen. I think we all know that new reality. 1.8 zettabytes, what's that? That's the amount of digital content that is going to be out stored in all of our systems by the end of 2011. That's an increase of almost 50% over 2010. And by the time we get to 2014, it's going to be seven zettabytes. And you know what? I don't, you know, this is an IDC forecast, but I don't really believe that. I think it's not going to be long. We're going to have to increase this, this estimate. Because you think about all those smart things I talked about, the sensors and the machine to machine. It, to me, it's obvious. It's going to be bigger than this. And so you've got this big volume of data, but it's not just the volume, it's the velocity. It's the velocity. I think about companies like Encore Energy 
which is an energy utility in Texas. And they've talked about their plans to go from you know, reading meters once a month or once every two months to once every 15 minutes and then being able to make some smart decisions by analyzing that data. One, every, once a month to once every 15 minutes, that's about a 3,000-fold increase in the volume and the velocity of the data. Okay, and there are a lot of other companies that are actually jumping a lot bigger, a lot faster in terms of their scale and speed. If you think about a lot of the new solutions that are going to be built off the, the platform and that are already being built, sort of the first generation of third platform intelligent industry solutions, they're all about capturing this big data and doing real-time analysis on them. You know, it's a different model. It's, it's, you know, you may throw away 90 or 95 percent of the data because there's so much of it. You only keep the stuff that's the exception. And you have to do the analyzing of it in real time or near real time because the data is never at rest. It's always moving. And when you take a look at these new systems, you know, what are the technologies that are capturing them? You know, they're the technologies that were purpose-built for this type of volume and velocity. You know, the NoSQL crowd, the, you know, the uh, Hadoop and, and MapReduce uh, technologies, you know, the data stores like uh, uh, BigTable and uh, SimpleDB and Big Sheets and Cassandra. You know, they're the ones that are capturing these new opportunities. You know, for a simple reason, this volume and velocity breaks relational databases. It breaks at rest traditional analytical tools. And so, you know, if you're in this business and you're a leader, you've, been, you've built on that model of relational and traditional analytics. So what does this all mean? Well, it reminds me of that point 25 years ago. You know, I didn't mention it, but one of the core ingredients of that second platform was, of course, relational databases. I mean, they mopped the floor with the prior. You know, the Cullinets, Cullinet again, Syncom, ADR, you know, IBM was also in the hierarchical database business. And they were basically wiped out by the relational database. You know, and it wasn't that they disappeared, it's just the new solutions where all the new growth was, was all suited for the relational model. And so I hear echoes of the same thing going on right now. You know, if I were a leader in the information business right now, I'd be very worried. Because, you know, my suspicion is that the relational databases and the analytical tools that are tied to them are not necessarily going to go obsolete but they're going to be uh, marginalized. They're going to be boxed out of a lot of the new growth. And so I think, you know, if you think about the, those old companies, part of the reason they went out of business is they didn't jump fast enough to the new technology. And some of them actually tried to bridge to the new technology by putting a little veneer of relational technology on top of the old technology. And they all went out of business, or most of them did, except for IBM, which had the good fortune of actually employing the guy who invented the relational database. So that, that was a good help for them. They made the jump. So what does this mean? I think if you're in this side of the market, it's very clear. You've got to, right now, be developing, acquiring, and promoting this next generation of data management tools and data analysis tools and approaches that were purpose-built for this high volume, high velocity, and a lot of it unstructured data. You know, you'll notice uh, HP just bought uh, uh, Vertic uh, Vertica, yeah, that's right. So, you know, and others are doing the same kind of thing. So, very important to be making this move right now. One thing I will say that disturbs me is I'm, s I'm hearing a lot of today's leaders talking about their bridging strategies. You know, they're going to bridge to Hadoop or they're going to bridge to these other types of tools. Hey, bridging's not going to work as a lead strategy, at least, as a lead strategy any more than it did 25 years ago. So, you know, I'd say the ones who ride that as their lead strategy you know, they'll, they'll go out of business faster than you could say, Wicked Trivia. Mark my words. Okay, so the last of the four things I want to look at is just the next generation of solutions. Kind of very simple question. There are going to be millions of new solutions on this third platform. What are they going to be? Well, I think one obvious reality is the market's not going to be interested in millions or even hundreds of thousands of redundant versions of the exact same horizontal apps that we've grown on for the last 25 years. That the next generation of apps, a lot of them are going to be very vertical focused, focused on a vertical, you know, a micro vertical, some sort of domain, process domain specific, language, country, regulatory environment specific environment. 
So that's, that is one reality, is that we're going to have a flood of these new vertical uh, solutions. The other is, it's kind of a challenge as well, is that the folks who've helped us be successful for the last 25 years, the folks on the supply chain side of our world who developed the new solutions, as well as the folks on the go-to-market end who cover that last mile to the customer, the channel partners, they're all optimized around the second platform, right? So our partners have all these skills that are, you know, they're based on horizontal apps, not vertical expertise. They're built on on-site deployment model, not cloud model, right? So their skills bases are becoming marginalized. So if we're in this world, as we all have to be, of thinking, what are we going to do to become part of this next generation of high-value solutions? We're going to have to, number one, prioritize our own vertical capabilities. And let, let me say, this is not the same thing as what I see in a lot of co uh, companies now, which is there's sort of an almost accidental vertical strategy or opportunistic. You know, 20% of my customers are retail. So, you know, uh, you know, a big part of my strategy is retail. No, some of your customers happen to be in retail. That doesn't mean you're actually expert on retail and aiming for that. So that's got to change. Another important thing is, of course, around reorienting our existing partners around the new platform. And frankly, cutting loose the ones who aren't ready to make the jump. And there are going to be quite a few of those. And then, of course, recruiting a lot of new solution developers, many of whom are not even IT people. They're not in our market right now. You know, these may be people who are experts on the new technologies in the, in the third platform, but more importantly, they may be vertical domain experts who were put off from the old complex model of solutions and now with the third platform, they can just layer on that expertise onto a very simple to deploy and distribute platform model. So um, a lot to do here. You know, Scott Lundstrom is going to speak later this morning about what a lot of these industry solutions are and, uh, and how much money they're going to be bringing into our pockets. So what I'd like to do at the very end here is really just pull together this thinking about this next platform of opportunity and ask the big, big question, which is, you know, where is the money going to be? You know, what, what kind of money and where is it that we're going to generate off this new platform over the next decade and the next decade after that? Um, you know, wh where are the new hotspots? And so before I show my answer, I want to bring on another expert. I saw a, a, a video of uh, Jim Breyer, who's the managing director of Excel Partners, which is a very well-known venture capital firm on Bloomberg TV, he was in Davos. So he was with the very elite crowd in Davos. And so they asked Jim the exact same question. So I want to show you what his answer was to what the next big thing is in IT. In August of 2010, Fortune Magazine named Jim Breyer one of the 10 smartest people in technology and the smartest investor in technology. Jim is here with us right now in Davos, Switzerland. Uh, <laughs> all right, and before we go, what is the next big thing in startup land going to be? What's the next big tech idea? Well, the, the big trend we're investing, whether it's China, U.S., Brooklyn, New York, is what we call social commerce, using people recommendations, social platforms like Facebook, and developing true next generation commerce applications, shopping applications, where black box recommendations no longer matter. Jim, thank you so much. Great insights into the world of social networking and the business of Axel Partners. Jim Breyer, one of the first investors in Facebook. My first reaction was, hey, if these guys are so smart, why are they wearing sport coats in 30-degree weather? Okay, now that's, that's pretty dumb. Okay, but the second thing I thought is, hey, yeah, social commerce, that's a good idea. And you can see that starting to build already. So, I, you know, bringing out our new framework, our frame of reference for opportunity for the next 25 years, can we find it? Hey, guess what? Yeah, there it is. Retail companies using uh, mobile devices and social business, you know, to create these social commerce platforms. There you go. We found it. But you know what? I think when we hear that and we look at that, we realize, hey, that's not enough. You know, we're going to need to find a lot more of what the hot solutions are for the next 25 years. So let's look for a few more. How about this one? How about healthcare providers using cloud services and mobile devices to create thousands of new telemedicine services? That's a good one. How about transportation industry and government leveraging thousands and thousands of mobile sensors with mobile broadband networks and big data analytics to uh, create a better 
a driver experience on the roads, to get more uh, productive public transportation and create in the process a greener environment. And one Jim I'm sure would appreciate, how about the financial services industry leveraging cloud services and big data analytics to do better job around risk management and fraud reduction? Okay, so you get the idea. If you want to understand where the opportunities are going to be off of this third platform, it's kind of a simple concept. You know, it's about connecting the dots. It's about creating high-value mashups of two or three or four of the different components on this new platform. And I'm not talking just at this top-level area. I'm talking about within those industries, there are dozens of sub-industries. And, and within those, there are dozens of processes and sub-processes. And then within the technologies, those five, there are, within each of them, dozens of sub-technology segments. And of course, this can be applied and built for customers across hundreds of different countries and different languages, and to be relevant within thousands of legal and regulatory frameworks. So do the combinatorial, look, <laughs> say that fast five times, do the combinatorial math. Yeah, we are looking at hundreds of thousands of potential new high-value intelligent industry solutions that build off of this platform. So if you wanted to see where the money is, if you want to follow the money, this is the way to go. Now, I want to, I want to add one more disruptive element here, and that is if you look at the net new growth in the industry today, each year that's coming in, look at 2010, over 50% of the net new growth was in emerging markets, in China, in India, Brazil, Russia, and beyond. So I think an obvious point is, as we start exploring and building this next generation of high-value offerings on this platform, we better do it with the scalability and the economics that, so that we can compete in these emerging markets at the price points and with the reach that these markets demand, which is quite demanding. Right? So our success is going to be, as I said, connecting the dots, but seeing the platform, understanding the components, and then connecting the dots, either ourselves or more likely with partners. So it sounds pretty simple, all right? Let's go. Let's go out there and do it. Well, no. I think we all understand it's not that simple. And in fact, 25 years ago in a room like this, there were a lot of smart people who were very confident that they were going to jump to that second platform. And as I said, a lot of them can only be found in Wikipedia now. So my advice as we start approaching this next phase in our industry, oops, sorry Jim, we're going to leave you behind, um, is to avoid their mistakes. You know, we need to avoid their mistakes, we need to avoid becoming the next generation of Wicked Trivia. And in order to do that, we're going to have to, number one, recognize that these new technologies, these new business models aren't isolated different pockets, they form a holistic collection, a new platform that's going to be the platform for our growth and new opportunity for the next 25 years. So that's the first step, see it. Second step, we need to prioritize these elements within our own portfolios. I brought this up several times before. We need to behave as if our very survival depends on our success in mobile devices and apps, in cloud services, and in serving the companies that serve cloud services, in being able to deal with and lead in mobile data management and analysis, in social technologies, in mobile broadband, and we have to get very good, very fast at creating vertical value, vertical solutions, and the partner networks that will get them to market. And we not only have to do that, we have to transform ourselves so that we embrace the business models of this third platform, that we leave behind the siloed, I'm hardware, I'm software, I'm services, culture and business model of the second platform. We have to be able to leverage and, and excel at this third platform distribution model, which depends a lot on cloud. We have to be able to, even if it's something we've never done before in the last 20 or 30 years, we have to become ecosystem centers. We have to develop our own ecosystems, either real ones or virtual ones. And we have to be able, as I said, to do it at a scale that can, can compete in emerging markets. Because you know what? the economics of the emerging markets are going to come back very, very quickly to the developed markets. We know that, right? So all of these things are incredibly hard to do, incredibly hard to do, but they're all essential if we're going to be leaders and successful in this third wave of growth in our industry.
So let me leave you with just one other thought. You know, we've talked for the past few minutes about how much like 1986, 2011 is. You know, with disruptive technologies, this incredible jump in scale in users and uses, that's happening again. You know, these fateful fork in the road decisions for the incumbents, life or death decisions. But I think we all understand there's one way in which 2011 is nothing at all like 1986. And that's the pace, the pace of our industry. You know, if we think about Cullinet, Wang, Digital, you know, they had the luxury of a much slower moving market. You know, they, they sat at this fork in the road and they, they thought and they rethought, you know, and they agonized about which way should I go for three years, four years, five years. You know, we don't have that luxury. You know, our, our industry feels a lot more like this. Right? So if we don't recognize the new platform, if we don't understand the components, if we aren't making those right decisions in the next one year or two years, there goes our future. So we're going to have to be a lot faster than those companies ever were 25 years ago. So that's my message. You know, and I'd like to say, you know, you may not have gone to Davos like I didn't, but you are here at Directions. And I'm glad to see that. And as you listen through the rest of the day to my colleagues, I think you'll find that it's a great place to be at this fork in the road, at this point of incredible opportunity for our industry. Thanks and have a great day.